Oh, Christine. What? I just know that I have to listen to a part two of that horrible story. I was wondering story. if you remembered or not. How, who could forget? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe everyone else who's gotten a week to not think about it, but yeah. certainly me who recorded the other half yesterday with you. Yeah. Two it's, days of waking up to some gruesome stuff. It's tough stuff. Um, Before we get into it, though, I, I would like to banter with you a little bit. Excellent. What would you like to banter about? I don't know. I just, my story is incredibly short this week. And so I feel like we have some wiggle room to catch up on things or, you know, say hi. I know you know this, but that is a dangerous kind of path to go down of like, we have so much time on our hands (laughs) because if anyone can. You know, I was lying. I was lying all the time. Anyone can use it up real quick. (laughs) The whole time I did not mean it. Um, Okay. Well, hmm, let's just do a good old fashioned how are you and why do you drink? Yeah, great question. I was about to ask you. Um, well, um, I drink because I exercise today. <laughs> Whoa, wait, do I... you drink for a good reason or a bad reason? <laughs> bad, bad, always bad. Um, what was your exercise routine? What did you do? So I am not a person who, like, I was at one point in my life someone who was, like, obsessively exercising. But I'm not good at being a casual exerciser because... Mm-hmm. I take everything a little too far. And so as people who've struggled with this know, it can be a slippery slope. So I've become very obsessive. And so I I kind of cut back for a while. And then obviously with the baby and everything. But I was like, oh, I want to like be more active, you know, in like not a intense way, but just like be more active. And so I found this group and I went out of my comfort zone and I did this like mom's fitness group thing today whoa I know I I signed up before I could talk myself out of it and I was like why did I do that and then um and I you take the baby with you so I took Leona and she met some other babies and were you were you part of like the stroller squad is that what happened it's literally called that I think like it's something (gasps) it's something really funny and cheesy and I remember being like oh my god my brother's gonna make fun of me and I told him he's like no I'm so proud of you and I was like that was nice. Um, I'm, so, I'll make fun of you. That was silly. But yeah. I am. I can't believe you went out of your social. I feel like you bragged about the wrong thing. You <laughs> stepped out of your social comfort zone. And that is much bigger than exercising. That's yeah. exercising your brain and your will. And it will. was <laughs> fun because like everybody had, if they did have their kids with them, it was like super. I mean, everybody like gets it. So if the baby is fussy or is hungry, like you just stop and like, you know, but Leanna had a great time. She was blabbing the whole time. And, um, it was just really low key and very, very like easy, basic, simple, just like, you know, shoulder. Did you make a buddy? Um, they did like a bomb pops and water guns afterward. And I had to go home cause, um, Leona was too tired and we had to record. Um, so I feel like next Aww. time I'll have to stay in really. So, but yeah, people, everyone was really nice and I think I might I t- try it again. So I took you away from water guns. That's so sad. God, I knew you felt it somewhere in your soul that you were. I, yeah, I felt that one. That one hurt. <laughs> but Leona had her hurt. first popsicle and it was a, ah. a disastrous mess, but it was very fun. Um, I can't imagine a baby with a popsicle's ever been a clean no. affair. And she likes to hold everything in her hands. So it just went everywhere um but, especially with her tight little baby fists yeah, i can just see it like it. seeping through her fingers <laughs> like she's like it's bleeding yeah exactly it was like it was a like it was prey it was of course grape flavor so it was a disaster but, it stained um, everything i'm sure everything yeah poor My clothes poor blaze's car but um you know we had oh. fun but yeah so i felt like i was doing something totally way out of my comfort zone both physically and socially so i had a um an interesting day and i think i'm going to be sore tomorrow even though I was just like walking the whole time, but I'm very out of shape. So ha- what about you, M? Well, first of all, I feel like an asshole because I've already yawned like eight times and like you sound like you've had an exhausting I'm drinking day. drinking a cold brew, so I am wired. Oh, okay, cool. I haven't had anything yet. I'm still chewing on sleep a little bit. So mm-hmm. um, what about me? Oh, I don't know. I, my, uh, I had a dentist appointment yesterday which I was nervous about and I'm still nervous about after the fact because I was told it was a cavity, but it was so close to a nerve that they were saying if it didn't go well, you'd need a root canal. <gasps> and uh, after I left the dentist yesterday, uh, 
it still didn't feel right. Something doesn't feel right. And I'm like so scared that it's like not going to get better and that I'm going to need a root canal. So it doesn't like I'm not in pain, but I'm just aware my tooth feels so different. They, they drilled the cavity yesterday and you just have to wait and see if it like did the trick. I guess so. Or I, it should honestly like I've had cavities filled before. It should like be completely like totally fine now. And it, it isn't. And so now I'm scared. Oh, <laughs> uh, so but they filled it yesterday. They filled it yesterday, okay, and okay. it just feels – it still feels a little sensitive. Whatever the filling is, it feels a little soft. Mm. It doesn't feel like it's, like – or I feel like if I bit down on, like, an apple the wrong way or something, mm. it would crack, mm. and I'm scared. So. How far – where where is it in your mouth? Like your molar? It, it's one of the good ones. It's one of the super solid one ones that chewers. I need. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the yang yang yang's ones. Um, I know. If it were, like, a little one, I'd say just rip it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay <laughs> I, i'm that drastic about it but this this is one like i really need to perform well at all times so uh -huh. um as a carnivore yeah, I, as a carnivore as well, someone actually, who i guess herbivores use these guys i learned from the dinosaur exhibit oh well carnivores i need... use the canine sharp ones oh okay well apparently i'm an herbivore because i need my crunchers i mean yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah you gotta grind um, it you know yeah, so I'm a little worried about that, but luckily my dentist is like ridiculously close by. So if there's a an emergency, I'm sure I can just <laughs> stumble on in, <laughs> hustle down there, and be like, "Please God, help me." <laughs> um, but yeah, I really it's um, I you, think maybe it's a mental game. I think I it's probably fine, and I've just just twisted it in my in my own head. So, mm. um, but that's the bad reason why I drink. The good reason why I drink, or the progressively less stressful reason why i drink is because i think fingers crossed by the time you're here the troll hole should be complete <gasps> by the time i'm there oh my gosh how exciting i know you if it, if it is you will know about it but if oh, it's not you boy. will also know about it but i'm i'm trying to hustle i really want it to be done by the time you're here um, well i'm expecting an evite because as you know i'm um, christine you fucking ruined it that's what i meant by you'll know if it's ready oh <laughs> <laughs> well i'm the one who started the evite train so i know if but i wanted to like, i wanted one. to ret i wanted to return the favor and if it if it's ready you will be getting you have an no idea how happy that makes me <laughs> even okay. if it's not ready then <laughs> next time i want an evite I'll, you'll still get an evite. It'll just be a, a, a date much further in the future. Oh, yeah. Or it'll just be like, don't come by. You're not RSVP invited to the troll. RSVP in 2023. You mm -hmm. let me know. Um, but so I, there's like one super big thing left that I have to get done for it. Um, and then after that, I'm like 95% done. I think the rest of it is just kind of finagling. That's so exciting. I'm very excited. I, can't I hope wait. you enjoy We're gonna it. We're going to have to do I've, like a Patreon reveal or something. Oh, I, there will be a tour. Definitely. Oh, I've excellent. put too too much blood, sweat, and tears into this. So. Yeah. Sounds um, like it. I've tried very hard to be very functional and practical with my space. So um, every little bit of it has been used. Wow, Em, I'm so excited. I'm very proud of myself. There have been I a few times too. where I, I there have been a few times where I just stood there in the middle of the room and I went, <laughs> I'm I patted my own back physically and then I went, I'm so proud of myself. Oh, <laughs> so dear. uh I believe in self-care and that was something I needed to do. So, but I, it is, it's healing something in my childhood for some reason. I think it's like the room full of things I always wanted, but was always told no. You yeah. know what I mean? Oh, I should make so, one of those. That would be chaotic. It's a blast. Yeah. It's very fun. So, um, it is chaotic also. <laughs> so the, it's just very fun. It's like a museum of all my hopes and dreams, I guess. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> let's do what you want with that. It, it's like, a. uh, uh hmm i don't know what the right word is but you know how like like there's like crazy words like phantasmagorium or something oh dear lord it's got it has a, it has a gorium at the end emporium a, maybe an a, emporium it's an e <laughs> there it is it's a troll hall emporium yeah it's a good time it's what it is i can't wait to see it uh, you're gonna have a blast so i don't know you better not be knocking it at all or you are not invited into the troll hall you better not okay. what you better not knock it at all. Why You've would got, I knock it? I don't know. Don't make Oop. you don't you whatever you see in there, you cannot judge. You just gotta know that it's part of the ride. That's what you think I'm gonna be mad you didn't nail the curtains to the wall like I do? I mean, I feel like I don't have a leg to stand on here, but You kinda do because every time you nail something to the wall, it does work. Thank so. you very much for uh finally admitting that. I appreciate it. I don't like it, but I also can't 
I can't fight it, you. Like, you're right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Factually speaking. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, anyway, those are my updates. Do you have any good, bad situations? Or are you just, is today just a day all about being proud of yourself? Just for... vibing, you know? <laughs> you're a social butterfly. Oh, my gosh. I was, like, so nervous because I'm not used to being social with people. Um but it was fun. It was fun. It was uh, very chill. And it wasn't chill because it was 96 degrees out. Um, so that part <laughs> was not fun. But And humid, I bet. Very sticky. Um, Disgusto. But that's what the popsicles were for, I guess. <laughs> Alexa, what's the weather today? 75. No okay, humidity. All right. Alexa, stop. She always call, wants to. She always wants to tell you more than you give a shit about. Call me in October and then we can talk about the weather. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's fair. You actually have like a fun, cool October. I get like thunderstorms and, and like leaves. I know. So listen, I'm not. I wasn't even gonna bring it up. I brought it up. It's my fault. Own fault. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to have a little chat with you. I just wanted to say hi. I Thank enjoy you. our. I believe it or not, I enjoy our friendship. So, it is yeah. hard to believe at times, but um, uh, <laughs> it, it's it goes both ways, my friend. Oh well. Uh, Cool. Well, I guess I've got my story to tell, but it is shockingly short. I, that's, I, I listen. That's fine. Nobody's gonna complain. I mine is long and depressing. So uh, I know, but then I felt like an obligation to like really deliver this time, and so like to fight off how like sad your story is. No, um, no, because that'll just delay the inevitable. You know, you're right. You just get it over. You're right. With. Okay. Well. <laughs> Okay, well, if anyone was looking for a road trip episode, it is not this one, I, I don't think. But Stop the if, car. If you're looking for something to, like, you know, brush your teeth to, that's what this is, so get ready. Oh, um, don't brush your teeth that long. I feel like you're, no wonder M has cavities. I feel like your enamel's all going to wear off. <laughs> okay, well, do it. Do something that takes uh, approximately 10 minutes of your time. <laughs> so... Shout out because I, as soon as I say this, you're going to know what I'm covering. But shout out to a podcast we were recently on called That Spooky for teaching <gasps> us about this. Oh, uh, I'm excited. It was a fun time. This It was a fun time to be on that show. And they were they very, are lo- a blast. very lovely. Um, and so while we were talking, at some point, cryptids came up, or I don't know. I truly don't know how it came up. All I know is we landed there, which is that I was taught about the Tizzy Wizzy. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll tell you how. They have a pet hedgehog, and they said the hedgehog's oh. Halloween costume is going to be the Tizzy Wizzy. And we said, I'm sorry, what? Yes, and they were like, that is you don't happened. know about the Tizzy Wizzy? And we were like, we're embarrassed. We didn't know this. I, I was embarrassed, definitely. Yeah. Um, so shout out to that spooky um they were very 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 sweet gracious hosts and even if you don't listen to them maybe uh around halloween check out their instagram because maybe you'll see a picture of their hedgehog dressed as the tizzy wizzy Mm -hmm. so this is in lake windermere which is in uh lake district i guess it's called like the lake district and there's a bunch of lakes um in cumbria england cumbria england oh okay okay Sure. I so thought Cumbria, we were doing like a Minnesota lakes thing and then we went somewhere completely different. So it, I It felt very Minnesotan. Uh, so. Like lake district. Yeah, you, I you had me going, but um so now I'm just kind of along for the ride. Okay, well good. Phew. So in Cumbria, England, there's an area called Lake District and it's a bunch of lakes and the one lake we're talking about today is Lake Windermere. And this was in at least it was either in 1900 or around the, ni- the early 1900s, but I think it was 1900. Okay. There's a boat man. What? A man who owns a boat. Oh. And he notices that tourism is just booming in the Lake District. Um, so he decided to try to make some money off of it. He was like, how can I profit from this situation? Mm. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a hustler, I guess. He's mm-hmm. like ready, ready to scheme. And so he goes to what I thought was a pub in one source, but then in another source, it's called Stag's Head Hotel. Oh. So I don't know if it's like a pub in the hotel. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's one of those old timey inns. Mm, I love an inn. Love a good inn. And so he goes and has himself a little drink while he's trying to scheme and plot out his next strategy. <laughs> and uh, he's going to... Th- <laughs> Here's the thing. 
he has some ideas at first that don't land here's wait that's what i don't care about anything else i want to know about the failed ideas this is i only saw this in one source and i was like i don't know if this is just flowery writing and maybe none of this is true but someone wanted to add more i want to know but since it's in a source i will be saying it as if it's fact (laughs) um so here are some ideas he had he is going to charge people to for him to dance on his boat um (laughs) starting strong question mark (laughs) also you have to really believe in yourself as a dancer that people with no frame of reference are going to want to come see you on it'd be one thing if like also he like by the way apparently the reason he turned down his own idea was because he was like well then i'd have to get dancing lessons so he (laughs) from the start was not a good dancer so like the 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 what you would call it the initial investment was too high because he didn't have the money yet to buy (laughs) dancing lessons oh my god this is like he was starting at like at a net negative i suppose yeah exactly um so he was like oh wait that i'm not a dancer so that might not work um because who would want to stand there and just like clap along while i dance on my boat and I also mean, are, i would are, but like, are they even welcome on my boat or like are they standing on the dock while i'm on my that's boat that's what and i'm dance? wondering uh and so he's like okay well we gotta we gotta nix that one so, <laughs> so then the, the next thing is he's going to the way it was phrased ekes me out uh he's going to charge couples i'm sorry he said lovers to oh. stay on his boat well that so yeah now i'm wondering is this did you say it ekes you out yeah <laughs> like ick is... you out sure I, I like still... eek you out that's interesting i think i have trauma from every time eva's ever talked about that's why i don't like that but but in my head she's saying ek because she spells it ek yeah i don't in my head i just hear eek and oh, then i, I... hear ek Oh, well, it certainly eeks me out. Well, it eeks me out. I say eeks me out a lot lately. I don't know where I got it from. Clearly not you, because you say it real weird. (laughs) Okay. it Maybe because eek sounds like freaks me out. Oh, maybe that. Yeah. I don't know. We could really tumble down that hill very quickly if we'd like to. It's just Um, just end in a trash heap at the bottom. (laughs) Yeah. Except we're already in a trash heap above. So it just Just becomes one big trash pile. Oh, we accidentally went to the dump. And now we're just rolling around. <laughs> well, it reminds me in school there at, at CNU, we had Mount Trashmore, which was literally a, a, it was literally a park built on top of like a, oh, a dump. And so when it would rain, the park would smell like sewage because the trash uh, yeah. under, they literally didn't know what to do with the trash. So they just put a blanket of grass over it. And then they put <gasps> some like recess equipment on it. Oh, no. And so you would just go to, Mount. it was literally called Mount Trashmore and you would, just go to the park but you knew you were dancing around on trash and uh yeah whenever it would rain it would smell like garbage because it was coming through the grass yuck anyway we started at we started at mount trashmore then we roll down the hill and then we end up in more trash that's how i see that trash anyway what a tangent um you told me you know you told me we had time what do you think is gonna happen you're right you're right you're right i also always there was a huge rumor that like at mount trashmore um there were dead bodies under the grass sure of course which like why i mean law and order told me that there's dead bodies in the dump all the time all the time and you can smell it when it rains so it's honestly whenever (laughs) megan's at the park you better look out because (laughs) she's gonna let you know real quick if it smells like a dead fucking body (laughs) if it's raining or not yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so um uh what was he doing oh so uh, yeah he, he said he was going to lovers what? aching aching out lovers he's going to charge lovers to sand his boat which confused me because i was like uh, that could mean a lot of things that mm-hmm. could mean a lot of tame things and a lot of x-rated things it could mean they're all kind of tra- icky like are you charging them to like have like a romantic one night like a picnic suns- like oh. a sunset boat experience right. or are you having them like rent like your a motel boat by hour <laughs> by hour or are you all i heard for some reason when i thought like charging lovers to be on his boat i really thought it was like he's paying like they have to pay to like go if they want to do it on a boat like that specific that's what i was thinking yeah like that's what i mean like motel hour by hour yeah like you need yeah. a private place yeah exactly and they yeah. have that now in vegas with planes you can rent a plane for an hour oh um like is it off the ground or is it on the ground no it like does like a loop for like 45 minutes or 90 minutes or whatever in the air 
in the air and like it doesn't look like a normal plane like the there's like the lol cockpit Whoa. which i i don't know why they didn't call it that but whatever um they called it like sexy time um, Oh, maybe it's like the Mile High Club or something. I think about, it's like another another play on words. What about a G sex? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that works also. Um, so they, but like it, like it's just the part where the pilot sits, who like knows what the hell's going yeah, on behind awkward. him, and then the rest of it is like literally just like a bed and pillows and roses and candles and like sexy music. Like it, it's clearly meant for you to. Do you imagine if we went on there just to like hang out and like just like play on our <laughs> Nintendo Switches the whole time? Honestly, <laughs> I think that would be a blast. I think that'd be so fun. I think it's terrible for the environment um, that you're just yes. flying around for no reason. But okay, um, I, I, we're talking hypothetical world where we're not actually going to do this. But right. it would be think of the party you could throw think on on like of think the of the possibilities. Think of the pillow fight. Think of the slumber party. That forty five minute slumber party you could throw up there. The forty. Five minute um, <laughs> slumber party uh, uh but yeah i it feels like you know it's existed before so when i heard this oh we could charge lovers to use my boat i i kind of felt like it was in the same frame of that he's just so. gonna like put some rose petals on the ground of his uh, boat <laughs> gross <laughs> yikes uh and he's gonna park it right next to like low tide at the seashore and it stinks <laughs> um so okay he those are some of his ideas and he was like this is not gonna work so i've got to come up with a different plan so as he's sitting at the pub trying to conjure up uh, a little strategy here a group of tourists all these people coming into his town a group of tourists come in and they make small talk with him but they hear that he has an accent and they like lose their mind which makes me think they're american yeah definitely and they say oh my gosh you're a local please tell us some like local lore they happen to be like spooky kids and they were like oh we love looking up like all the haunted places and all this like please tell us some like spooky local lore also like it's not an accent if you're in their hometown do you know what i mean people are ridiculous i know uh and so they said tell us some spooky mystery from this area and so the boatman who never gets a name by the way um (laughs) the boat man Maybe the uh, strategist, as I like to call him, with all of his big marketing plans. I like um, that you say it's strategist instead of strategist. But yeah, strategist. I also say eek instead of ek. I, so I know. Don't know. Sorry, Listen. this is my American accent. I don't know if you're familiar. <laughs> so sorry. Um, okay, so so, so, <laughs> so he's sitting there and he heard, oh, tell me a story. Tell me a lore. And I think it sounded like he couldn't come up with anything. And so he's like quickly scanning the room looking for inspiration to bullshit these people um so he's sitting there and he's like scanning the pub scanning the pub and there is a portrait of a hedgehog okay sure and he goes to them and he's like have you ever heard about the tizzy wizzy oh boy so from the beginning we can pretty much guess the tizzy wizzy might not have existed it's in his own mind only he was like this is my moment to really wow people here we go take it take it and run well he sure did so he tells them that he himself has had encounters with the tizzy wizzy Mm. and i don't know if he said i'm the first or only but um he certainly i don't think he made it sound like it was a very common thing to run into he made the tizzy wizzy sound very shy you're very lucky if you ever catch one um and then he convinces this group of tourists to accompany him to uh to the lake the next day yeah, for a tizzy. Yeah, he just tizzy... wants people on his boat. He's such a weirdo. He's just obsessed with getting people on his damn boat. I see. I'm one of those people too, where if you have a boat, I'm kind of obsessed with getting on it. So I would be down to work with him. You yeah, know what I mean? I like guess. if someone says I have a boat, I'm like, okay, I guess I'm. What kind of pick boat is that? Like I'm picturing like, I'm a I'm a imagining, <laughs> yeah, I'm imagining like a. Like a Tom Sawyer Huckleberry Finn boat. Yeah, like just, that's what I'm thinking. Like something like just a bunch of boards nailed together. <laughs> I think that's what I was picturing when it was like I invite lovers onto my boat, and I was like, "Cool, that's going to be a great time." Um, Maybe, at but it best, might be fancier than that. It's I like don't know. it's like a Lieutenant Dan Trimpin boat. Maybe mm. I don't know. Well, at, and we're at in best. 1901 or something or 1900. 1900. Yeah, I don't know the boat facts from that year, unfortunately. So 
Well, you have officially given me something to hyperfixate on. I will be. I'll know everything about boats by the next time we record. Don't worry. Oh, okay. There's a lot uh, to know, so don't say you'll know everything because I'll know everything about the style of a boat in 1900. In that specific year, yeah, great. The more specific, the more intrigued I am because I'm like, oh, it's doable to learn. Of course. So anyway, he is one of those people who just wants people on his boat. He's like, look, I used to be really bad with my money, and this was a bad investment because nobody comes on my boat with me, so you need to come with me. Sure. Makes he doesn't sense. actually say that, but instead he says, come with me on my boat, and we will go on a tizzy wizzy hunt, since I know all about tizzy wizzies and you don't. That is super fun. It's way better than his like dancing and lover's idea. Imagine in today's world, though, you meet someone who tells you all about like a cryptid in the area and then just that random person's like, come with me on my boat to go look for them. Like ding, 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 red flag, red flag. You could tell me anything and then say, come get on my boat and it'll be a red flag. Like you could say, (laughs) I I don't even know if there would be anything normal to proceed that with. Come get on my boat is just a red flag. There is the stereotype that uh, Republicans have boats. And Mm. so for me, that's now if I hear I have a boat. I have to be like, who did you vote for in 2016 before I get on this boat with you? I mean, my stepdad has a boat. My sister has a boat. But they're like the, they're like um, fixer uppers, shall we say. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> but they're uh, fun. That's, that's very sweet. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I'd trust getting on a fixer upper unless I was with someone who'd done it a few times. Well, that's I... the thing is only when my stepdad is there will I get on the boat because, uh-huh. um, yeah. Your stepdad can also fix anything. Yeah, exactly. So like even on the fly, if we're, um, you know, sinking real quick, we're not sinking. Their boats are not that bad. I'm making it sound really, really trashy. It's not that bad. But um, yeah, they like refurbished a boat and reupholstered it and it's really nice. But um, wow. I don't know. I that's guess very nice. That's just some You're... anecdotal evidence against your your uh republican comment i guess well thank you but i I do know at least on the the tiktok the side of tiktok i'm on it's a very common to get a video of like yes like trying to appease uh the republican so i can like spend the weekend on his boat (laughs) oh (laughs) lord okay Hmm. so it becomes uh it becomes a trope pretty quick so uh i don't know who this man voted for in 2016 probably no one since he was probably dead yeah. Um, uh, and also he lived not in the United States. So I don't think anyway. Honestly, this man could have lived lived on in many ways. He sounds a little out there. For all we know, he moved to the States and lived to be 100 years old, 116 years old in both. Could be. He takes them out on this little tizzy wizzy hunt and he has them lying on the ground with their ears to the to the to the woods to the ground um and he has them listening for a tizzy wizzy he's like he's like just just listen and let me know if you hear anything because if you hear a little squeaking that's how you know that the tizzy wizzy's nearby oh boy um and so they're all out by the lake by his boat listening to the tizzy wizzy on the ground and all of a sudden the one of them says i think i hear something i think i hear squeaking and the boatman goes, quick, follow me. And they start running through the woods, sprinting oh through the woods. Oh, my God. He says, he's, uh, after they're running for a while, he says he saw the tizzy wizzy run off in one direction towards Belle Isle. And a tourist says, wait, I was looking over there and I didn't see anything. And the boatman said, well, of course you didn't. They're amazing underwater swimmers. You wouldn't see with a, without a, a trained eye like me. Oh, boy. Are these people, like, for real in, like... They think this is real. I they kept going, yeah, so I guess, I guess. So. they went on then someone's again, boat. I was gonna say they're also probably trapped on this uh, on this <laughs> man's boat. So, <laughs> so, and then they they did believe that when he was like, "Oh, well, you obviously you didn't see it because you don't have a trained eye like me." Sure, and they were like, "Oh, okay." So then they believe him and pay the boatman extra to take him. On the to take them on his boat to go over to Belle Isle to keep searching for him to keep searching for the tizzy whiskey. Okay, and obviously they find nothing. Um, and after this, the boatman realizes that this is a new way to cash in on all the tourists coming into town. Tell them to go look for the tizzy whiskey. Say it went towards an island. Get them to go on your boat so you win in two ways, and charge them extra if they want to get on the boat to go over to Belle Isle on to, a hunt. <laughs> on a hunt for the tizzy whiskey. Um. After all this, 
and he realizes that he can cash in on this, he starts taking people on Tizzy Wizzy hunts, and he eventually uses the money to buy treats to lure the Tizzy Wizzy Stop. out of hiding in hopes to get a picture. Okay. Um, so at least that's what he told a friend of his who was a photographer. He's like, I'm going to find the Tizzy Wizzy, and when I do, get a picture of him. Mm-hmm. So this is now 1906. Oh and God. What a racket. This five years. Five years of him just you know moving and grooving and bullshitting bullshitting uh scheming and dreaming i guess so. we could we could do this for a while mm. so the boatman in 1906 he takes uh he tells a photographer i'm gonna go get a tizzy wizzy once and for all and i'm gonna bring him back to take a picture so we can use him as use the picture as promo for my tour sure of course he goes on his own tizzy wizzy hunt or so he tells people he puts out ginger biscuits for the Tizzy Wizzy. That was what he apparently knew this guy was going to love. Of course. And according to what he told other people, a Tizzy Wizzy came right out at the sniff of the ginger biscuits and he was now face to face with a Tizzy Wizzy. And our listeners, sorry, and our listeners at this point don't know what it looks like. So we have, because I, I know from the description that that spooky gave us, but like they don't even oh. know how big this thing is or anything yet. So this is going to be quite a shock to everyone's system. They do not. And I have a picture ready to send you when it's time. Fantastic. Um, so these ginger biscuits, they pull out the tizzy wizzy and the boatman allegedly finally catches a tizzy wizzy for himself mm. and it sounds like it was a real struggle to get a hold of the tizzy wizzy the tizzy wizzy apparently was uh squealing and squeaking the whole time Aww. it was like they were really in fisticuffs with each other Poor i suppose thing. and the boatman then brings tizzy wizzy to the photographer apparently this photographer was at lewis herbert's f- photographic studio which was opposite <laughs> saint martin's church so okay. what a lot of detail directions. there. <laughs> in case you want to be a part of history, you have to go all the way to St. Martin's Church and then look across the street. Okay. And at this uh, photography studio is where he shows the Tizzy Wizzy to the photographer. And the Tizzy Wizzy is still panicked and a little Aww. shell-shocked from, uh, from his fight. From being grabbed? Yeah. From being captured. And so the way to calm him down, obviously, was to give him more ginger biscuits and some warm milk. Okay, well, that's nice. It would maybe calm me down, too. Yeah. And when he's calmed down, the photographer finally grabs one picture of the Tizzy Wizzy. Okay. And then the Tizzy Wizzy takes off. And one source even said he flew out the window. Oh, no. So now we can fucking fly. Wait. (laughs) And I have a picture for you. I'm very excited. I've never seen it. Oh, no? Okay, well, well here. Have I? Geo's I Trio. When would you, I have seen it? Oh, well, you're certainly about to now. Sent. This is the picture the photographer took. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my so, God. Oh, my God. So this little <laughs> character <laughs> flies out the window <laughs> after a, with a warm belly full of ginger biscuits and milk. Okay. And this wow. is a description of him. The oh, wait, body... I guess everybody knew it was already a hedgehog, kind of, because I you said Because that... of the conversation, yeah. But also you said there was a portrait of a hedgehog and he got inspired. Oh, okay, yeah. So but the yes. description is, uh, I, this is from one source, so I'm just going to copy the quote here. <laughs> a body of a hedgehog, the wings of a dragonfly, the <laughs> antenna of a bee, and a huge fluffy tail like a squirrel. <laughs> and really, this is clearly a hedgehog with like, a tail wings and antenna just like taped to it it. looks like it's wearing a bumblebee costume to me yes it does look like it's wearing a bumblebee costume and a tail a squirrel tail also um which means like the struggle must have been just like holding a hedgehog down to be able to tape this onto him poor thing um and this picture by the way uh we will have this on our instagram and it says at the bottom it says the tizzy wizzy found only in bonus bay windermere so yeah, um, really beautifully uh, painted sign, and I will say I did not think this is how you spelled Tizzy Wizzy, but it's spelled me either T I Z Z I E dash W H I Z I E. So I guess okay. I I thought Wizzy would have two Z's something, and I, yeah, and I thought they'd both end in a Y. 
Me too. But um, you know, clearly not. Clearly, I need to take this tour because I need a lot. I have a lot to learn still. You know a hot nothing about mm. this. That's right. I'm just saying. You know a lot about the stroller squad now, but not a lot about the tizzy wizzy. <laughs> So this picture ended up being used on postcards that the boatman would sell on his future tours. And the Tizzy Wizzy is still known for this exact same description because it's the only picture to ever exist of of him. And uh, he has a reputation for being very shy, a good swimmer, a fast runner. Maybe he can fly. And also, according to the boatman on his tours, you can only hear the sounds of his faint cries and squeaks uh, when heard at water level. So keep your ear close to the water. Um, which means like, does he live underwater? Is that what I'm know. hearing here? Uh, so the boatman did tours of like this for the rest of his life. And many say that they only went on the tours just to meet him because it sounded so bizarro. Yeah. And others in the town also began hosting Tizzy Wizzy hunts. And I guess some of them like would end with like, it makes no sense. This seems like such like a, a dude mentality of like, oh, it's going to be funny, man. Uh, but there was these tizzy wizzy hunts where I guess you they would take you all the way down to like the end of the pier um, or like underneath the pier to like finish out your tour. And someone ends up getting like pushed in the lake at the oh. end. Oh, like, can you imagine like it's not very nice in my mind in the early 1900s? Everyone was just dressed so like many layers. T- to the nines all the time especially if you're on vacation it's like how would you would go to the movie theater in the airplane and like your finest church yeah, clothes you're wearing i mean you're going on, on a boat ride like you're not wearing like crocs like i am today you'd be yeah, wearing like, something <laughs> quite fancy i imagine yeah so apparently someone always got pushed in which makes me mad for them um, yeah i don't cause... i feel like that place is probably haunted with just the the vengeful <laughs> ghosts of those people who got pushed in See, just the anger of wet clothes. <laughs> and so uh, that was, I don't know if they still do tizzy wizzy hunts, but people in the area do still hope to find a tizzy wizzy. Uh, at least their their tourist friends do in Lake District. And Gosh. maybe if you have some ginger biscuits or milk, you might find yourself a little tizzy wizzy. I'm Who obsessed. Knows? I'm like fully just enamored with this thing. And I don't know what to do about it. It's I'm... I love him. I don't know what I to do. I love him. I don't know. Especially, I have a soft spot for hedgehogs, and so this right. one just looks like he's just ready for Halloween, which is, by, by the way, again, uh, for that spooky, when they said that they were going to dress their hedgehog up as the Tizzy Wizzy for Halloween, it makes total sense it now that I've seen sense, the picture. It doesn't it? And it's such a great yeah. costume. Yeah, my brother's obsessed with hedgehogs also, so I feel like um, he even calls his group uh, the, the hog pen. Oh, my God. I can't. That's very funny yeah and so, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, uh does your brother know about the tizzy wizzy i don't f- think so and so now i feel like i need to inform him immediately zandy zandy Schieffer is about to get He's one silly present and it's the story of his life <laughs> the surprise of his life oh ah. and that was good thank you I'm well so thank pleased. you for th- Thank you for letting me banter probably a little more than usual. Probably not any more than usual, no. but thank you for knowing in advance it was coming. Because I texted Christine yesterday and I was like, I, I'm i not used to my stories being this short. I'm probably going to over talk out of nerves. So I mean, don't worry. We are already at 40 minutes, so we've gotten pretty far into the episode already. I just opened my phone and I have a text from Blaze saying, I know you're recording, but I took Leon to the museum. I'm like, wait, what? Blaze is such an active father. That is is. so nice. I'm like, all right. He's like, we wanted to walk in the AC. So they're just looking at dino fossils. I'm like, have fun. We wanted to walk. Do you think babies can sense how miserable heat and humidity is? Yeah, she was so sweaty out there today and I felt so bad. I had to um, put like little water on her to cool her down. Wait, even she was sweaty? Oh, very sweaty. Yeah, poor thing. Oh, little baby. I know. It was very hot out. Um. So next time I will, uh, I don't know what else to do. She doesn't drink water yet. So I'm like, I don't know. At what point do babies drink water? I think they can't, like she can, but like she doesn't need to because she gets it from formula. Um, so I think at a year old, maybe you're supposed to start feeding them water. That's like, so wild. Baby. In my mind, like we just drink water from the second we're born. It's weird I'd never it's... even thought about that. Oh, I lied. Well, oh yeah. You can feed them water at six months, but um, after 12 months, their main drink should be like water or something different 
wild. I never even I never thought about it. I know it's kind of weird. Um, Does she have a new favorite food other than broccoli, or is it still oh, broccoli? Oh, great question. Um, is it great popsicles? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> she's kind of over um, broccoli and butternut squash because I was like, oh, she loves it, and so I just kept making it, and I think she's over it. Um, but she really likes Swiss cheese and bread. <laughs> Now that's my kind of person right there. <laughs> she is on her way to making herself a good old deli sub right there. It, it basically ends up just being whatever I'm eating. I'm like, here, this is not a choking hazard. All right, try enough. it. And she's pretty. Um, I think she'll be a foodie like her father. Nice. Maybe she'll so. also be a, a bourbon drinker like him. Oh Lord, let's hope not. At least not anytime soon. <laughs> well, not anytime soon, but she, it's it's in there. I think it's in her heart. She'll yeah. find it. For Father's Day, I got, please, I told you, I think, a bourbon uh, bottle that had, like, happy first Father's Day, love Leona. And he was like, okay, so my infant daughter got me some alcohol. And I was like, yeah, it's not the greatest. I liked it. (laughs) I liked it. (laughs) Okay, well, the fun stops here. (laughs) Yeah, well, I hope everyone was in a tizzy with the tizzy whizzy. Yeah, it certainly uh, was. Now it's over. It's over now, and I will say last week I at least had fun facts at the start about Girl Scouts and cookies. Um, don't got that for you today, but uh, okay. Thanks I got for telling us. this end of the story, so at least we're going to get this over with and tell the rest of the story, not leave you hanging this time. So, previously on, and that's why we drink. <laughs> <Bing>. <laughs> Bark! Uh, so we are following the murders of Denise Milner, Michelle Gouzet, and Lori Farmer, three Girl Scouts whose lives were taken on the first day of their Girl Scout summer camp in 1977. Yeah. If you're listening backwards, please listen to the episode beforehand first because I'm kind of diving into the second half here, so I don't really have um, too much detail here. So we've just discovered that two months before summer camp took place, there was a training weekend in April of 77 for the counselors. And on that trip, camp counselor Michelle Hoffman discovered um, that her tent had been ransacked. Mm -hmm. You remember that part? I sure do. Someone had eaten all the donuts and left a note beginning with the sentence, we are on a mission to kill three girls in tent one. Yeah. So they had like full warning before children even got there and... But like, what do you do? You're 18 or 15 or, you know, it's I like, don't know. I part of me wants to be like, why didn't you tell the police? But then I can also see an 18 like, year old thinking you, it's a prank. But so, what do you do if you tell the police like they can't do anything? Do you know what I mean? Like, maybe I've just watched too much Law and Order. I just feel like Olivia Benson would take it seriously. But then I think about like, but in I every I, episode, someone gets killed. So it's like nobody's well, I, gotten hurt yet. Well, I really because you were saying in the last episode too the like, a lot of people were blaming them, but they're also kids. I can understand at 18 thinking that's a prank or like mm-hmm. someone being silly and like, that's not, that's not it, but they yeah. don't know that yet. So I don't know. I mean, how would you think that that's re- <laughs> You just think we- someone has like a shitty sense of humor and yeah, exactly. You know? Um, and like kids are dumb. Like they, some kids would probably do something like this and be try to scare the girl camp counselors or something like who knows especially yeah that's a good point especially in the woods when the whole point is like not the whole point but one of the big things you do is like around a campfire trying to scare each other stories yeah exactly um and there was also this like effigy of a man hanging from a tree just like very spooky Mm. shit but um cap uh camp staff dismissed it as pranks of bad taste and, like, again, I know people are always, like, tell the police, but sometimes I'm like, well, police can't do anything. If you're like, oh, uh, we got this creepy note, it's like, well, what are we – they didn't do anything illegal. I mean, they ate your donuts, yeah. but, like, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Um, so I feel like there's just not much to do. And, like, I'm sure – I'm sure looking back, of course, it's like, oh, shit, we got a warning. But, I mean, who would have thought? Well, this whole episode, I – from the beginning, I've been saying, oh, imagine the survivor's guilt. Yeah, so let's exactly. Just, it's let's hard. just tack that on, you know? Yeah, it's hard to imagine. Um, so as interviews were going on after the murders, police began drawing up possible suspects. And originally at the top of the list was a man named Jack Schroff. So mm. Schroff was a local farmer, and it was determined that the tape and nylon rope that was found on the girls and at the crime scene had come directly from his farm. Oh, 
However, Schroff was quickly crossed off the list as a suspect because he passed a voluntary lie detector test and they basically figured out that the murderer stole the rope and tape from his farm. So gotcha. wrong place, wrong time for this guy. Yeah, poor Jack Schroff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not not a good time to be um, owning that brand of duct tape, I guess. Right. So despite being dismissed as a suspect, uh, it gets worse for Jack Schroff because the media hung on to his name and like put his face on the newspaper with the title Slayer. Oh my and, god. And like basically hung him out to dry and oh shit. He got harassed, he was threatened. Um and so like, it, like what today's version of doxed. Yeah, basically. basically. And like yeah. t- it, which is so rough because he was never even like really considered as part of the you know, like he was suspected because of the connection with the duct tape, but like he wasn't there was no other evidence. Like he was connecting. an early ruled out suspect. Exactly. So like, and he just got like stuck in like got, his like, name. Put on blast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yikes. It was really rough. Um, but then the police announced a new prime suspect, 34 year old Native American Cherokee man named Gene Leroy Hart. And his middle name spelled Leroy. I just want to put it out there. Most of the people I listened to in the documentary pronounced it Leroy. So I'm just going to go with that. Okay. Um, so Gene was serving a 309 year sentence oh my god why for the burglary kidnapping and rape of two pregnant women in 1966 <gasps> oh so he is much more likely to have done it in my mind yeah than already sh- right fella. yeah already um he had gagged both women duct taped them and left them in the woods to die oh my god but one of the women was able to break out of the duct tape and free both of them oh my god wow okay. yeah talk about like a survivor story yeah and so you're thinking well he's serving a 309 year sentence how could he have done this well uh he had escaped prison in 1973 and was at large during the murder of denise laurie and michelle okay got Just it already looking fishy mm-hmm. so some other strangely convenient facts about gene Leroy hart he grew up a mile away from camp scott and was familiar with the area um, one of the pregnant women he had kidnapped and raped said that he had used nylon rope and duct tape on her as well. Mm. And the same woman also remembered that he had made, mm, this is bad. Mm, this what? is bad. What? She also remembered that he had made these strange guttural sounds as he assaulted her, similar to what the camp counselors remembered hearing oh, on God. the night of the murders. Well, at least that's like some evidence there right like at least that's like proof pointing to a direction yeah i mean i think it's i know this word is kind of annoying but like circumstantial because it's like well you yeah. heard a noise that you thought was an animal <sighs> yeah i mean it's at it's at least a lead it i sounds would consider like it a, a lead it's a very solid lead i would agree yes um and the same woman said that she and the other pregnant uh victims wore prescription eyeglasses and she remembered gene trying them on so oh Okay. There was like that thing where he left the glasses at the scene. I don't think it was her glasses, but like he had taken glasses from another cabin and was like, Mm -hmm. it was just super creepy. Interesting. So Gene was swiftly climbing the leaderboard as a key suspect. And on June 16th, three sniffer dogs called the Wonder Dogs (gasps) showed up. Well, that's my favorite part of this entire story. Uh, I know. I finally found something to not cry about yeah in exactly. this story they worked for nine days uh before the wonder dogs led investigators to a cave approximately three miles from camp scott and fun fact a hundred feet from gene's family's home so oh okay the cave uh suggested like the state that it was in suggested someone had been living in it and inside they discovered photographs that had been developed of two women a roll mm. of tape which matched the duct tape at the crime scene, pages from a Tulsa newspaper which matched pages that had been stuffed inside a flashlight found near the bodies at the crime scene, cigarette butts, four burnt extinguished tobacco piles arranged in a half circle, women's underwear, and a pair of sunglasses in a vinyl case that had been stolen from a counselor at Camp Scott. Yeah, I call that a ring ding ding right there. Right? That's a ring ding ding. I think so. So the uh, they also investigated another nearby cave where they found writing on the wall that said 77-6-17, which is the date of the murders. And then it said, the killer was here. Bye bye, fools. <gasps> 
Ugh. Whoa. Well, that's also ring ding ding. Right? Icky, yeah. icky, icky. So the thing they kind of latched onto were the photographs of the women um, because they figured, well, if we figure out who these photographs are of, then maybe we can find who was in this cave. So Lewis Lindsay, a prison employee and wedding photographer, came forward to police and he was like, those are my photos. I took them, but oh, I was shit. not in that cave. <laughs> oh, my God. And it turns That's, out. What a, by the way, like what a if he's innocent what a scary thing to have to admit knowing you're just yeah, like, you're like implicating so yourself awkward you're never gonna believe what happened but <laughs> those are my, my photos girl this is crazy <laughs> and you're not gonna believe me but hear me out i wouldn't believe it either but just trust me Ugh. so guess what uh he said oh well I was working in the prison's photo lab and I had a prison inmate working with me named Jean Leroy Hart. Oh, okay. Well, that'll do it. So basically he took the photo, presumably, allegedly took the photos from mm -hmm. the lab and like kept them. Got it. Like a creep. Um, so now they're like, okay, we think we're onto this guy, Gene. We're gonna, uh, we just need to catch him because mm -hmm. he's still on the run. So according to the Mile Higher podcast, uh, this now led to what would be Oklahoma's largest manhunt at the time, with the search costing $1.28 million <gasps> in today's money. $1.82 million? Two eight, but yeah, $1.28. $1.28. Whoa. Jeez. So it was a huge search. Uh, meanwhile, with news breaking that the perpetrator was a man at large living a low-key life amongst nature surrounding Camp Scott, 400 volunteer locals gathered together on June 24th to kind of just do like a four-mile circumference around the camp to try and find him. Uh, and this is where things get dicey, racially speaking, just because um, when people, you know, find out that they're searching for a Native American man, um, the local Native American population understandably gets a little defensive and are like, okay, so you're searching for this guy. So some of the volunteers who showed up for this search were quite drunk and armed. And so Ooh. it's almost like, it sounds to me like a pitchfork, you know, like, yeah. So I understand why the danger there was kind of yeah. present, like a potential sure. danger. Sure. Um, and so uh, some of the local Native American community turned up to monitor the event just to make sure things didn't get out of hand. Okay. It was just a recipe for trouble. Um, no discoveries were made from this search. So on the morning of July 28th, security guards at Camp Scott's Great Hall thought they spotted what they later described as a silhouette in the woods, and they went over to investigate. Hmm. When they couldn't find the person they thought they had seen, they returned to the Great Hall and they found a pair of shoes with Denise Milner's name on them sitting Whoa. on the stairs in a bag. Ew. Well, ew, in a bag. That just makes it extra creepy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like they had not been there before because the security <gasps> was just there. So basically, oh, they I see. Sorry, yeah. So they saw that makes somebody it extra worse. out in the woods. They went to investigate, and when they came back, someone had placed a bag with Denise's shoes. Got it. Got it. That, on okay. the stairs. That's so sinister, and it like is. it almost feels like because if the cave said like the killer was here, bye bye. It almost sounds like I got away with it, but he's still lurking he's and like is, taunting them almost. He's like watching his. Yeah, ew, crime scene or whatever Watch, you call it. Watching what he did and come to fruition. The aftermath or, of it. It's gross. Yeah. And the fact and that then, he kept and that. Give, and giving them more leads of like, oh, you thought you found me, but you only found this. Mm -hmm. Ugh. It's like stringing oh. them along and it's, it's pretty sick. Yeah, so... The Tulsa Tribune wrote an article the following day titled Shoes Mysteriously Appear at Scout Death Scene. And like just the fact that they thought they saw, saw somebody like he lured them outside just to like put that there. It's so Ugh. absurdly creepy. So now they knew that the killer or at least someone linked to the murder because they had her shoes was clearly keeping a close watch and taunting investigators. So to test this, the guards went into the nearby forest and tied thin strings between the trees. And mm. the following day, the tri the strings between the 
trees had been snapped and footprints were found. So clearly somebody was like lurking around because this camp for obvious Ew. reasons had been like completely shut down. Yeah. Um, so there should not have been somebody wandering around there, but so they did determine somebody was lurking. And despite it seeming that Jean of all people was so close proximity wise, it took 10 months of searching <gasps> to capture him. Oh my God. Yeah, why? Do we know hiding. why? Yes. So on April 6, 1978, police received a tip that Hart was staying at the home of Sam Pigeon, who was an older Cherokee medicine man. And um, according to the Mile Higher podcast, quote, medicine men in Native American culture are traditionally non-judgmental and open to helping Native Americans that were true believers. That is what their explanation was um i don't i could not anywhere find any other explanation except that um sam pigeon was just giving him a place to stay and uh, okay. be safe um from the elements and so he was protecting him essentially and so the police went to sam pigeon's house and sure enough found him there um he was wearing women's glasses that were thought to be have been stolen from camp scott <gasps> yeah because he was trying to mind creepy yeah and he was found with items that had that were definitely determined to be from camp scott including a blue mirror and a corn cob pipe probably oh the my. only time i've ever heard of that phrase outside of frosty the snowman <laughs> um sorry that i just i've never heard anyone actually use one before me okay either, but i guess maybe it's i feel like that's something I don't know. Sounds like something you'd do in Oklahoma. Yeah, it sounds just, like something that only Frosty the Snowman's ever done. <laughs> I just like that there's a corncob pipe at the Girl Scout camp. Like, who was using right, that? Like, who was, like, I feel like that was, like, the the tough one on the street. She was, like, I don't know. It's I feel a, like that was, like, craft hour. They were, like, now for Father's Day, be. we're all going to be making corncob pipes out of our <laughs> leftover corn. I, I have no idea where why they're, may, I guess, maybe, like, a camp counselor... In my mind, this is like, why am I gendering a corncob pipe? But I feel like it was like a, like a dude that worked at the... Yeah. I mean, I said Father's Day craft, so, yeah. you know, I don't know. I, but it just, it doesn't feel like something certainly like 13-year-old girls are using. So. Yeah, it was very, it was a random uh, thought that crossed my mind of like, who was originally <laughs> using that? But I, who knows? I don't who knows? know. But he took it along with a blue mirror. Um and when they arrested him, his first words to police were, you'll never pin it on me. Which is <gasps> like, yikes. Which, by the way, first of all, that is some of that good old-fashioned confidence of killers that we've yep. seen a million times. But also, like, you just said you'll never pin it on me with, without even being confronted. Exactly. So, like, how do you know what we're here for? You all, You just outed yourself. Also, you have things literally from... Like you, ha there's so much proof. There's so yeah. much. What do you mean? You. What do you mean? It's so scary. Um, I the mean, I think he confidence. knew. I assume he knew why they were there because he was on the run and they had been looking for him for months. So I don't oh. think it was like okay. why. Why are they here? But because also I assume if they arrested him, they said it was like for the murder of. Uh -huh. But to say you'll never pin it on me is not the way <laughs> I think but an innocent person would respond. If. If I got arrested for that, you bet your bottom dollar, I'd be crying going, oh, I didn't do it. Like not, you'll never pin it on me. Yeah. Like, it's just a very creepy way to respond to, um, very to cold to, yeah, to, yeah, exactly. Um, it's just a, a weird thing to say. So two years later, we're now at March 19th, 1979. The trial begins against Jean Le Leroy Hart and, uh, you know, it's hard to believe, but I think I got a lot of um, context from that docuseries I was talking about mm -hmm. uh, with Kristen Chenoweth because Jean had a pretty vocal group of supporters who oh. were defending him. And part of it, I guess, was that he was a local boy. He had played football. He was very you know pillar of the community yeah yeah <laughs> people were like oh i mean even in the interviews in the show people were like no i know like i know him he wouldn't do this and it's like just the ultimate example of you know people just not but also this guy was already in jail for raping two pregnant women did you think he was gonna do that you know what i mean like that's a good point that's he a very good point was in prison for something heinous so he can't be that good of a guy 
maybe they just all thought he was getting pinned for the wrong things over and over again or something. Maybe, I don't know. But I don't even know if he claimed to be innocent of the first crimes. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know. Like, then I, I, maybe these friends aren't uh, totally with it, I guess. I, I don't guess know. not. I don't know. So he had quite a uh, group of supporters. And then in addition to the people who knew him from high school, there were also people, um, Cherokee people who were, you know, defensive of the fact that basically white people were accusing him of this crime and people were not convinced that he had done it. So there was a lot of contention, Mm. um, you know, for obvious reasons. And so there was this fundraising event in aid of him um, so that he could afford his defense lawyer. And it said there were about 400 supporters in the courtroom what? Yeah. The fact that 400 people. I, I really want that to be like one person and his 399 children. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's hard to believe. It really is. Wow. He, it, that's And also goes to show you how, I mean, we find so many pillars of the community mm-hmm. doing this. Like mm-hmm. it, the, the power of charisma can really swindle somebody. It's shocking. It really is. And um, <clears throat> like, uh, I think the hardest part because I obviously, like I said, got a lot of context from this docu-series about, like, the racial tension and why people were automatically, you know, obviously feeling defensive and, mm-hmm. like, feeling infringed upon. And, like, you know, they'd already been through so much at the hands of these, you know, of white people. So it's yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. you're coming in here and now you're putting someone on trial. So there's that. But then also on the other side, on the flip side, you think about the families and the parents of these three girls who show up and there's 400 people supporting the person that you think murdered your child and it's like it must just be such a hard thing to sit through i don't even know who to feel the worst for at this point i know i know it's it's just an awful i can't imagine them i can't imagine well i can't imagine being a mom obviously but the the experience of seeing so many people going against you like when defending. you're just trying to you're yeah. just trying to find the person who killed your baby exactly exactly and i think that kind of got lost in a lot of the shuffle which was really sad and one of the moms who was interviewed i think it was Lori's mom said which i thought was really powerful really interesting she said um at the time she was a lot more naive and she's like looking back i see now like why there was so much more like at the time she was like what the hell is wrong with you people like this man Mm -hmm. murdered my child and she said like looking back she can see now more of like the inner workings of why this became such a heated uh debate Mm. almost but um it was just really hard on the families to go to court and have 400 people obviously sitting there being like he didn't do it and (laughs) you're just trying to find some sort of answers yeah and again this guy already was serving a 300 year sentence for raping two pregnant women so i'm like what on earth like he is clearly not the pillar of the community everybody thought he was like how did he not at least lose half of those 400 people in the first situation crime yeah so it's it's a toughie and like i don't even feel like i know enough to take any sort of but it's it's just it's just tough um it's very complex and you know it's again if you want more context i would watch that docuseries it's very interesting um but so Along with the items stolen from Camp Scott that were discovered at Pigeon's house and the cave, which were presented as evidence, multiple people testified against Gene, including expert witnesses, people associated with Camp Scott, and former colleagues and friends of Gene's. And the prosecution, which was headed by a guy named S.M. Buddy Fallis Jr., were more Mm. than confident they had enough evidence to convict him, even though the court had strangely barred the prosecution from referencing any similarities between this crime and the rape of the pregnant women okay so basically the whole incidence of like they couldn't even talk about the other crime so they couldn't talk about gene's attack on these pregnant women in this trial got it got it it, which i sort of get but also it's like that to me is already such a powerful like an argument it's such powerful evidence of like look at what this person's capable of especially if you have people testifying like character witness like oh Mm -hmm. this guy's a great guy and it's like really you know well especially if you have to keep like i understand like that was a separate 
right. trial and so you have to keep i understand like the legality of it but like it's so Im- important to this person's character and like if you're going to completely different people outside of that situation to be like this person's amazing exactly like, well that's not the true that's not a full picture it's not and you know i i don't even really understand the legality of it because he was already convicted of that it's not like it was like up that's for true. debate you know it's that's just true weird to me that it wasn't they... even alleged yeah exactly and so I thought that was weird. And so they couldn't say anything like, oh, well, he was already convicted for using nylon rope at this crime. They couldn't like say, oh, the oh glasses, oh, the rope, oh, the duct tape. So there was just a lot of that was lost. Um, Ugh, I'd be screaming if I were the lawyer. So frustrated. So frustrating. And so the main pieces of evidence that the prosecution brought up uh, linking Gene to the murder scene were a strand of hair and semen found at the crime scene. Uh, Mm. An Oklahoma State Bureau chemist testified that the hair on the tape used to tie up Denise was an exact match to Gene or belonged to someone who had the same microscopic characteristics as him. And I want to take a moment here, which I think they also brought up on Mile Higher podcast to say like hair evidence has is like kind of largely debunked, I think now. Like it's, it's kind of like blood spatter where it's really not as specific and like as as we kind of all thought it was based on like law and order episodes and csi and so i think if you have the follicle like maybe you can use that but i think just looking at a strand of hair ended up being kind of more bunk science than actual factual evidence but Um, assuming that this is truly the guy it did work in our favor this time (laughs) yeah 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 and so um for what it's worth you know they said oh this is an exact match to gene um and in, and again i'm not an expert here so i if i'm wrong about this please forgive me um this is just what i believe to be true in my research but um so in relation to the semen sample this became a point of contention because gene told the court he had had a vasectomy and so there should not be you know sperm that could link to him However, after some tests, it was revealed that Gene's vasectomy wasn't really successful. Oh, yikes. Yeah. Yeah. Yikes in like its own totally separate way. Like I was going to say like, hmm, I think Gene himself has his own lawsuit he can be worried yeah. about. <laughs> I was like, he probably didn't expect that. But um, yeah. that was what was found out because uh, a lab technician testified that the semen sample was in fact Gene's. And so at this point, it's sort of like, how like this is obviously the guy is what it, not of what everyone's thinking what i'm thinking and what i think people um who weren't on his side were like well we got this in the bag you know like we're we're set but i guess they didn't have as strong a case as they thought they did i'll just put it that way sure so Gene's lawyers had been hired uh, from the city's Native American Center, and they were very, very successful in dissolving the prosecution's arguments. So in relation to the semen, um, prosecution questioned the results, arguing that what the investigators were able to determine was only that the semen sample was a match for a non-white male with type O blood. And so that's no. what they told the jury, like, that's all that they're able to prove um that being said if you really do the math on that um it Mm -hmm. only corresponded with 0.002 percent of the population (gasps) so like that part wasn't you know necessarily made clear but it was very good lawyering of like oh well Uh, it could be someone else and you know just leave out the percentage part right 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 right. so that i I, you know i can understand why that would give enough doubt to the jury to be like well if it's just a non-white male with this type of blood I can see why there would be doubt there. Um, In relation to the bloody footprint that was found in tent number eight, it apparently didn't match Gene's foot size um, and the fingerprint on the flashlight didn't match him either. But what they didn't clarify was that the fingerprint didn't match anyone because it was only like partial, like a really small bit of it. And so they said, oh, well, the fingerprint doesn't match him. But they said, well, there isn't a whole fingerprint. Yeah, but they didn't clarify it doesn't match anyone because we Uh can't match it to anyone so it's like a lot again it's good lawyering lawyering. yeah Yeah. (laughs) it's like kind of telling it spinning it in a certain way um and the defense also had a great roll call of witnesses um one of which was a local waitress named dean boyd and uh dean took the stand and told the court that she had seen 
a man named William Stevens in the cafe on Monday morning. And William Stevens was a convicted rapist. And so basically now they're like pointing to someone else as part of their sure. defense. Um, and so she testified that he was looking really nervous and she saw him lurking around the cafe. Um, and then an 11 year old scout girl scout also took the stand and told the court that she had also seen William Stevens around the campsite before the murders. Wow. Wow. A friend of William Stevens named Wayne Peters confessed to loaning Stevens a red flashlight and said that on June 13th, he had come home. uh, He had come to Peter's home with bloodied boots and scratches on his body. So Mm. now they're building a whole case against this other guy. Wow. So he really this guy really was like shockingly not wrong when he said you won't be able to pin it on me. Yes. Yes. That's sick. That's really gross. The cockiness was like warranted, I guess. Ugh, I really I wanted I really wanted him to have to eat his words. I know. I know. It's very frustrating. So to top this all off, uh, the friend Peters told the court that one night when the two were drunk, Stevens confessed to the murders. And I mean, I'm thinking, isn't that hearsay? Like, oh, mm-hmm. he said he did it. Whatever. Uh, so though Stevens predictably denied having anything to do with it, um, they s- collected samples from the scene. They didn't match him anyway. So... I don't think they were ever going to really build a case on him, but it was more just to throw doubt about Gene um, into sure. the case. So the trial lasted until May 30th, 1979, oh. and the jury only deliberated for five minutes. Oh, <gasps> wow. And, found, and it was not it was not good up for us, was it? No, they found Gene not guilty of the rape and murder of Denise, Lori, and Michelle. And for them, there was enough reasonable doubt. Um, I think the prosecution really felt like they had it in the bag and were feeling mm. a little too confident and didn't think through like all the ways that this could have been spun. Mm. Um, and according to Denise's mother, Betty Milner, she remembers that after he was acquitted, people started cheering and rejoicing, and it just must feel so awful to be sitting there. Yeah, I just can't imagine. No. And so he did technically win this case, but he obviously had to return to prison for his 300-year sentence <sighs> anyway. Right. Hope you enjoyed your vacation right? out here. Yeah. Must be nice. And honestly, like, it's still not really... I mean, I guess there is still some victory in the fact that, like, oh, he would be accused and proven in front of everyone to be guilty. But it it still wouldn't feel good to know that, like, well, he was already going to live out his life in jail anyway. I I feel like he wasn't given up proper. I don't know what the proper punishment would be, but it's like someone beat us to that with a a different punishment. I know, like he was already in prison. And it's just so frustrating. Yeah, it's very frustrating. And, I mean, I wish at least they could have gotten some justice which again that's something like i think we probably can't even understand because like yeah. we're not in that position thank god um but yeah i imagine it would at least be really a sense of closure or at least from mm-hmm. what i've read and heard people say that like when nobody is convicted there's just this like question mark almost even if yeah. you feel like you know who did it yeah so this 300 year sentence was cut short when Two months after the verdict, Jean Leroy Hart died of a heart attack in the um, prison's, like, exercise yard, basically. Wow. I feel like all of this was very unfair. He was 35 only. (gasps) I know. Wow. I don't know how to feel about that. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. But I just, like, damn, like, didn't even have... I I mean, I guess you're dead. That's, That's a pretty bad punishment. But also, like... You don't even have to suffer for as long as nope. I, my, my brain tells me rightfully should have. Yeah. And there was a little bit of controversy surrounding that because some people thought he's been he was poisoned or that like somebody mm. had killed him. Um, but then they did an autopsy and they determined that he died of a heart attack. And when they spoke to his mother, actually, she explained that his brother had died of a heart attack in his 40s. So oh, shit. they just had clearly like a, you know, bad genetic heart situation going on and so um this is probably not gonna be surprising but it's still just kind of like i don't know affronting um his funeral uh was attended by 1300 people i'm sorry did you say 1300 yeah 1300 people went to his funeral and yeah. i assumed they were all like to like to like friends mourn him yeah 
I really so, want it to be 1,300 people saying, that's right, fuck you. Yeah. No. No. Wow. Wow. Um, also, how do you know 1,300 people that are willing to travel to a funeral? Well, I, I know think that's it such was a, all the such locals. I think it was just people in the Cherokee tribe who were like, just, or, you know, or his friends from high school or people who were supporting him, not necessarily knowing him even, just like supporting him on the basis of like, gotcha. we don't think, we think he's getting unfairly um, uh, accused or, you know, what have you. Um, mm -hmm. because he, it was like a big media sensation. And I think part of the kind of icky part too, is if you watch some of the press conferences, you can see them ac asking him questions in press conferences, like, and he's looking all smiley and they're like, oh, well, uh, what do you think about Watergate? And it's like, oh, what? this guy is accused of raping and murdering children. And you're like, hey, bud, what do you think of Watergate? What are your, yeah. takes? what's your hot take on politics? And it's like. Just a so little schmoozy. It does. It's so weird to me. And like, talk about eking me out. I felt like, yeah. <laughs> felt really weird about it. And uh, like, even if, because this was even before he was um, acquitted. So it was like, he's on trial for this, whether he did it or not. It's like, just so weird to me that he was able to get such a kind of rally going for him. That's so weird. It is. It's very weird. Um, especially of all crimes, you know, you'd think like, yeah. This is he's not got, the one. He's got but, a handful. He's he, got yeah. He's got a, a really bad, really bad, like indefensible crimes that like he's being accused of. So it's hard. It's hard to wrap your head around. I guess. Um, yeah. There's been a lot of further speculation, obviously, um, especially after he passed away so suddenly, and there was not any closure really. Um, so here's some weird shit that like went down afterwards so in 1989 a reverend named gerald manley who attended the preliminary preliminary hearing and the trial as an observer came forward to the media to reveal that he had been present during the murder what i, I know i know it's <laughs> it's sorry like, what come what again you what did about? you say next i'm gonna hear like 1300 people attended the murder and i'm gonna be like what is going on with this, I this story and so he told them there were four perpetrators. Okay. <laughs> and he said one of whom was called Leroy, which I assume uh -huh. he's talking about Leroy. Um, and he would be able to identify two of them. Although maybe Leroy, I think he's talking about a different Leroy, I guess, because he says um, he was present and he one of the guys was called Leroy and he would be able to identify two of the other perpetrators so this is his story according to Dallas News he had gone in to tell the police his story six times in three years but they were unconvinced of his involvement oh so already weird situation so uh, a private investigator named Ted Laturner spoke to Manley who revealed the full story under hypnosis okay what is going on hang on uh, as, I know as well as passed a polygraph test so at the very least I think this guy believes his story whether it's true or not I think he seems to be convinced about it okay um and so Gerald is a Methodist pastor he lived about 11 miles away from Locust Grove and he told the private investigator under hypnosis I think that on June 13th 1977 the day of the murders he had been driving and ran out of gas when two young men stopped to help him he befriended the men who had been drinking and they drove him to get gas and in the car he overheard them discussing how they had stolen a purse from Camp Scott and stolen wire and tape from the Shroff farm oh and shit Gerald the reverend or the minister decided they were quote in need of a christian influence <laughs> girl what girl what oh my god okay so and he was that, like that wow feels these like that feels like a ding 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 to me so he's like these fellows are up to no good and so either way they get his gas drop him back off at his car and he goes off to meet a friend in tulsa but they all keep in touch oh thank god <laughs> old friends but i guess Gerald meets up with them later that week and they play dominoes together and have a great old time hanging out. And then on the night of the killings, uh, he drove around the Locust Grove area in search of one of his acquaintances, parked his car and went to sleep near Camp Scott. Sometime later, he was awakened by one of his domino partners who wanted Gerald to come with him to go down to where some of the guys are. After a brief drive and hike, he found himself in the Girl Scout camp being led by his acquaintance into a tent. 
Uh-huh. In the darkness, he said he could see at least four men in or around the tent, two of his domino partners and two men he didn't know. Oh, shit. He said once inside with only light from a partially covered flashlight, he said he saw the body of a girl on the wooden floor and he <gasps> saw two sleeping bags containing bodies. Whoa. He said, I was scared to death. I didn't know whether they'd kill me or not. After he had been in the tent a short time, the men decided to leave, carrying the bodies with them. About 150 yards down a path leading to a service gate, the men became frightened, dropped the bodies, and ran in separate directions. And uh, he said with the first hint of sun coming up, he finally made his way back to his car and drove nearby uh, to a town called Chuteau to have coffee. Oh, oh. this was a very, that was a lot of chaotic turns. Like, what is going on here? So, oh, yeah, I don't, I'm very, I don't know what to say. And I'm realizing that I said, like, on the day of the murders, he befriended these guys and they stayed in touch, but that doesn't make sense because. Right. Wait, hang on. I think I must have written that down wrong. I, I assume he had met them when he ran out of gas that one day and then they met up later mm-hmm. on the day of the murders to play dominoes. I'm assuming yeah. is what happened based on the story, but uh, he explains that he had coffee and didn't tell anybody because he was afraid of the men so he didn't call the police okay well it's just hard to believe that a minister who sees three dead bodies of little girls like just goes have a coffee and it's like like unfazed i'll just keep my mouth shut (laughs) yeah it's i think i need a cold brew like that's what (laughs) that's it me too um he's just so bizarre So, though the State Investigation Bureau director, Robert Hicks, said that they couldn't find any corroborating evidence to support Gerald's case, several people who knew the minister said it was uncharacteristic for him to lie or attempt to draw attention to himself. But I'm I'm like, but yeah, but y'all also said that, uh, that, what's his name, was that Leroy, that heart was like a fucking pillar of the community. So I don't know if I trust your trust you on that but it's just odd so like it's hard to know if this is something that really happened if he just kind of developed the story subconsciously and like it came out during hypnosis if he's like just disturbed like i don't know what the i don't even know what answer i want i don't either i don't either i can understand like not wanting to say anything because you're scared they'd find you since they like know where you play dominoes i guess but like i feel like i would just i don't know i feel like and it did say that he went in six times to police after gene's arrest and they just didn't believe him so i'm like it's not like he never told anybody it's like they just dismissed him i mean maybe he's telling the truth i don't know i don't know i really don't know actually and i I I want to add too that like there was um there were reports people at the camp saw multiple flashlights or multiple oh. lights in well, the then woods. Well, that then that would make sense, right? Yeah, but it's hard. It's also hard for me to believe that four people and then this would, guy. I guess it would make sense for some things with like the footprint and the fingerprint not matching up or something like that. Or Yeah. I don't know. But then you would have thought like, well, I was going to say Leroy would have happily told people like oh there were three other people but then like no he wouldn't have because he would have been implicating himself that he was there to begin right so right right um, right right. yeah this is a thinker man it's a thinker thinker. um i still feel like he did it but i'm like me too i I wasn't there but my my what i would tell myself at the end of the story is oh it feels like he did it no yeah i mean but it's just like did he do it alone or did he do it with i think he did it alone three other people yeah i i'm inclined to think that way too um, and it's like, I, I just feel like it's so hard for, it would be so hard for four people to pull this off and not ever say anything or get in any sort of yeah trouble or not say something while drunk sometime. And right. It's yeah. just weird to me that if it but, did happen and there were four people who all got away with it, it's like in a bad way, impressive. Yeah. 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 I mean, and I wonder if it just died with Gene when he had the heart attack and Mm. that was a lot you know i don't know i don't know um so anyway the murders of course of farmer guse and milner remain unsolved unfortunately and everyone especially their families are still hoping for closure after all this time um and though there is plenty of evidence to suggest that gene 
Leroy Hart is responsible. It's another common theory that this could have been multiple people. Um, I think you and I were both kind of stuck on that. Uh, and the girls at camp uh, specifically describing there being multiple flashlights um, mm-hmm. is part of that evidence. Uh, and so firstly, we have to take into account Gerald's story, the pastor, even though it seems a little wacky, like, you know, maybe he's telling the truth and this really happened. Um Secondly, Sherry Farmer, Lori's mom, has commented saying, I have always felt in my gut there was a girl present. Oh, what? Interesting. And she said, and given the DNA results, you have to wonder if there wasn't also a female who took part in the murders. Um, And in that quote, she's referencing how in 2008, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation retested samples from the crime scene and found that one of the girls' pillowcases contained a DNA sample that didn't match any of the girls. Mm. Uh, But at the same time, like at a Girl Scout camp, it it wouldn't surprise me. Everyone's touching everything. Yeah, yeah. it wouldn't surprise me if like another girl's hair got on their pillow or something. So I don't think that's like a slam dunk. Um, And then in 2011, uh, John Russell, a man convicted of embezzlement and check fraud who served his time in Ottawa County Jail, said that another inmate named Carl Lee Myers, who was guilty of the 1996 murder of Cindy Marzano, also confessed to being the Girl Scout murderer. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Jeez, okay. Just casually. And before Myers died in prison in 2012, authorities were able to link him to the rape and murder of Sean Williams, but not the Girl Scout murders. And John Russell, the guy in prison for the embezzlement and check fraud, um, said he wanted to make a film about the Girl Scout murder case called Candles. Um, Rose. (laughs) But that hasn't come to fruition yet, so I don't really know what that's about. So... We've pretty huh. much reached almost the end of the story. Um, and so I guess let's just bring it back to Lori, Denise, and Michelle's families. Um, ever since Denise's murder, Betty Milner spoke to Tulsa World and explained, this makes me very sad, that she was too overwhelmed with her daughter's death that she has been unable to visit her grave after all this time. I don't blame her. It's so tragic. I think everyone everyone grieves different. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Michelle Gousset's father, Richard, went on to found the Victims' Bill of Rights in Oklahoma, wow. uh, born out of Richard and his wife feeling like law enforcement ignored them. According to Ranker, he established this bill to keep victims and families involved in every step of the legal process. The Compensation Board helps provide victims and their family members with money to assist with expenses like medical bills. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, Lori Farmer's mother, Sherry, went on to create something called the Oklahoma Strand of Parents of Murdered Children organization, um, which provides families with care. And according to News on Six, quote, losing her daughter, Lori Farmer, in 1977 changed her life forever. And she has spoken up since that day to make sure Lori's life will always matter. And so as for Camp Scott, it was immediately shut down and remains abandoned to this very day. Uh, and there are photos and v- people go there just to like kind of lurk around and like it's very mm. spooky as you can imagine it's just like an abandoned girl scout camp where three Ugh. people were murdered it's very i can spooky. only imagine the people who've gone there just to like do a ouija board or yeah, something if it's that, not yeah, cute don't do that don't do that folks yeah. Um, and so anyway, there's a lot of sources, um, a bunch of sources. A lot of people have talked about this and covered this. Uh, one of the websites that was most useful is called girlscoutmurders.com where they really go through everything as well as the YouTube documentary, someone cry for the children, the Oklahoma girl scout murders. Um, and then of course the docuseries I was watching on Hulu called keeper of the ashes, um, which is sort of partially hosted by Kristen Chenoweth, who's from that area. And th- and that came out in May. So that was like a very recent um So wild. Coverage. Like great timing for you to yeah. cover it now. Because I put it, it off for so long. <laughs> yeah. Well, yikes. Well, and it's just like so rough because there's no closure and like you really wanted to get that justice and it just never happened. And yeah. it's just sad. So, I mean, hopefully you never know. Like, you know, 50 years ago, nobody knew we'd be able to analyze dna someday so maybe there's some way we'll be able to close a case but yeah i i definitely think one day there's going to be some practice we do now where they're going to be like that was not good but right? we've got something so much better yeah, yeah like when i mean yeah who knows what someday they'll be like face palming about yeah you know 
like how so. we now like how people would like clean up like uh mm-hmm. crime scenes or like move everything around or not touch things or now now i'm just like what in the world were you doing what i feel like thinking people are totally gonna do that one day they're gonna watch law and order and go every episode's oh dead yeah wrong. Dead we're gonna wrong. like take photos of a scene they're gonna be like a photo you're not taking a holographic diagram right. blah 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 a time right. rewinder to see who a did time it. Re- <laughs> uh, I've always assumed at, at some point there's going to be a time rewinder. I think about that a lot, Em. I think about it weirdly a lot because yeah. I feel like then they're going to... I think it's going to... When time travel is invented, if it hasn't already been invented, but mm. it, if it's been invented in the future, that technically means it's been invented in the past. If uh, You just give me chills. I'm just saying, if you can go to the past from the future, That's you a can really time travel in the fucking past. fucking good point. Uh... It is weird that in the future that we don't know about yet, maybe they are solving crimes already and they're just being sneaky about it and we don't even know. That know. is a very interesting point. Um, oh my gosh, that my head talk about headaches. I'm like <laughs> overwhelmed by the thought. I used to get have that thought whenever my brother and I would get into like a really bad argument. I do too. I do it all the time. Anytime I do something I'm like not super proud of, like I don't know what it like if I like, pick a wedgie, like something stupid, I'm like someone can see. Oh, I'm talking about like if we'd get into an argument, I'd be like, I want to rewind time to prove to him that I was right. Like, I'll be like, no, I said this. And he'll be like, no, you said this. No, I said this. And there's just like no way of winning. And I'm like, I wish we could just like rewind for a few seconds. I would love to play that game with Allison because there's a lot of things she says that she does not remember. And I'm like, girl, we've done you this. You said that. Yeah, exactly. So um, I, that's when I think about it. But who knows? No, I, I see. I'm always paranoid. I'm like, what if like time travel already exists and i imagine people who are a part of like the time travel patrol or whatever it is <laughs> they also like get like invisibility cloaks or something yeah there must be some way of covering your tracks if it does exist because like- well if it didn't exist by the time time travel exists you can just go further into the future and grab that technology and then you've got it like once you've got time travel anything's possible whoa but i always think that like someone is this is like be, like the definition of fucking paranoia, but uh, I always feel like anytime I do something like pick a wedgie and I'm by myself, I'm like, someone it, it has time traveled to this period and is in an invisibility cloak and is staring at me from the corner of the room and just watched me totally embarrass myself. Like, uh-huh. well, that would be weird, weirder for them. Sometimes I feel like it's like my ancestors being like, I wonder what grandpapa was like and it's just me picking my cheese yeah all the well time. that's the thing too that i think of is like i just always assume a ghost is watching me like pick my nose or whatever i'm like there's definitely a ghost watching me do this i guess that's true and i like to think oh well ghosts are at least we can guarantee those are from the past not the future that's true but mm-hmm. i don't know do ghosts well, see time the same way because they might just be interdimensional and can go wherever they want what if a ghost that is haunting you right now is actually a future relative of thinking. yours that died and they're yeah. just fucking around. Honestly, I'm just saying, it could get crazy. Possible. That's why when people are, uh, when you're on a Ouija board and you don't know the name, maybe it's your future great, 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 great grandchild who died and then is traveling through time just to check in on everyone. There's nothing better to do than play Ouija board with you. I would, if I were a ghost and had the ability to time travel now, absolutely. I'd be going back to see my old, parents parents i don't think i want to know what they were doing i think i would just be disappointed in them well there's certain people i definitely feel that way about but there's other people where like i gotta know i want to know like what some people were like up to as little kids i think that'd be so fun what if they can't okay well never mind okay it's my own brain is breaking they were probably just picking their wedgies just like you i know it i know it well, we got to do a little aftermath but um i have to pee first so let's wrap this baby up And that's why we pee.